Hi everyone, my name is Gabrielle and I'm from the Singapore Art Museum and welcome everyone to a date with Sam Jeremy Sharma, a program as part of the fourth edition of Sam Mini Mobile Museum, which is a traveling art exhibition held in partnership with the National Library Board. So please note that we will be recording the talk and publishing it on Sam platforms such as Facebook and YouTube. And by joining this virtual meet, you've consented to the recording. Please ensure that your microphone is muted throughout the talk. And if you have any questions, do type and submit them using the Q&A function on Zoom. We will be compiling the questions and selected ones will be answered during the Q&A session at the end of the talk. So today we have here with us Jeremy Sharma, the artist, and also joining him is Kenneth, the assistant curator at Sam. So over to you, Jeremy and Kenneth. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, I hope you can see me okay. I'm using my home uh, laptop, which is um, not the most uh, ideal situation, but uh, I hope everyone can see me okay. Uh, well, thanks for joining us uh, this evening, um, despite everyone's busy schedule. And I'm also very happy to be joined tonight uh, with Jeremy to have a little chat. Tonight's session will be really quite informal, um, really casual. Uh, and I just want to take the opportunity also then to have a chat with Jeremy. Uh, in particular, some of his earlier works. Um, I've selected a couple of works um, in the last eight years to have a chat with Jeremy about, and hopefully that gives us, uh, as well as myself also, a kind of better understanding of Jeremy's practice over the years um, before we come back, I guess, to the subject um, of um, the presentation with NLB, uh, which is Slender, the most recent book that we presented um, as part of Singapore Art Museum's uh, Mini Mobile Museum, which is now currently on show at uh, Woodlands Regional Library. So yeah, uh, thanks for having, uh, thanks for joining us, Jeremy. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Kenneth. Shall we start? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So I wanted to begin really this conversation um, speaking about some of your earlier paintings, um, because I think some of us might know that you were formally trained first and foremost as a painter, right? Um, before everyone kind of know you as this person who's been working with uh, various media. Um, as well as installation. And so I wanted to really set the conversation first with uh, the Gaussian series, which is really um, one of my personal favorites. Uh, we can talk a little bit more about that and why it's one of my favorites. Um, but I was kind of curious to have you maybe speak about the series um, in terms of maybe a little bit of the title itself, um, how they work for you, um, the color choices and the kind of processes in terms of the making of the paintings, but also some of the thought processes behind them. Yeah, so I'm looking at a slide now. It's, this is done in 2012. Um, so yeah. the Gaussian series came about, um, uh, well, it's uh, quite a number of years after I did my, my, my MA in uh, LaSalle. Um, so I was still very much invested in the practice of painting. And I was trying to sort of um, discover the dialectics between uh, an image and an image and an object as, uh, as a painting. And I think the Gaussian series came about at looking, looking at modes of abstraction. And um, it was about this gesture of blurring the, the, the image. So, um, so for example, this one is called Seascapes. And so I, I do not work on just one painting. I work um, in a series of works. So, so I create like a body of different series of works <clears throat> based on um, different categories. So this one is based on seascape. So um, this is basically an abstraction of, uh, of a seascape. And what happens here is I'm trying to find the median or the average color of the photograph and create this kind of um, should I say an atmosphere in the painting? So what you get is a, a is a sense of the atmosphere or, or the temperature of the image or the sea, right? But it's actually um, derived from actual photographs. So I, I did um, like a few series, one on the sea, one on the nude body, um, um, and a few from from various uh, photographs. Yeah, I think we can see the nudes on the on the second on the next slide, right? Um, where there's a kind of abstraction of the average colors of new uh, paintings, right? Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so for instance, right, this is also a part of the series and you were mentioning that um, it's kind of a, uh, I guess a sampling, right? Uh, there's kind of various samples that you're looking and drawing from 
and then um, you kind of work through the colors uh, slowly over time. But I, I, I seem to recall uh, in an interview that you don't just paint one, right? Um, it's not as if, um, you know, you kind of decide on an ideal average and then you paint just one Gaussian nude, right? You actually go through a whole process of painting several yeah. um, before deciding on one. Yeah, I, I go through several um, paintings before I decide on, on the final pieces. So I might go through a few rejects before mm. uh, settling on the final painting. Yeah, so because it's not, um, because the, the gesture of painting is not the same as digitally altering an, an image through, through Photoshop, which is very instant, right? Painting is a very sort of physical activity. Um, so um, in trying to create a certain kind of gesture, it needs to be right uh, to get a particular kind of like uh, image. So, so you're right to say that I was kind of extracting data from, 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 from photographs yeah. to, to create paintings. Which are very physical and tactile okay. and, um, material. Let's say. Yeah. yeah. Right. And on average, how how many would you say how many pieces do you produce before deciding on on one? Um, I think. <laughs> well, like on a good day, I could just hit it. You know, uh, with the first one, but if it's a bad day, then maybe it's uh, I'll I'll it will take like a few more paintings or. Or I'll go through a few paintings during the week until I, I mm. want to so maybe like the sixth painting, the seventh painting will be the right sure. one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What strikes me about this series the most is that people don't actually get to see the process, right? The kind of so called rejects yeah. um, that you actually have to plow through um, before you decide on one. Um, but then also, I guess the title itself is also always quite interesting to me because um, I guess. Well, if my math serves me right, if I still remember my math, it's the Gaussian refers to that kind of uh, normal distribution. Yeah, it does. Right? It does, it does re refer to a, a mathematical function. Yeah. yeah, to find. So so I was always struck by, you know, the, the process of, or at least the suggestion that this is a kind of average style uh, sample colors um, from the subject that yeah, is in parentheses in your title, right? And, yeah. and in many ways, um, you know, you, it's, it's kind of an abstract painting um, just by color alone. Um, and sometimes also the texture as in the case of the um, seascape, right? Um, you do actually get a sense, you do actually perceive the subject without actually even seeing so-called figurative representations of them, yeah. right? And quite, 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 um, quite significantly also, if you notice the difference between the seascapes as well as the newts, right? The difference is one is uh, kind of a squarish, but nonetheless landscape mode. Mm -hmm. And then this is um, quite probably a portrait orientation, so that goes back again. You know, mm -hmm. I think anyone familiar with um, painting and its language yeah. um, can see the nudes without without even seeing actual yeah. um, naked bodies, I suppose. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I really love this series, and I, I think it's a wonderful way to uh, think about um, your practice because number one, first and foremost, um, as some people can see in the captions, I hope um, that this is not on canvas. Oh yeah, right. this was never done. Canvas. You actually, done, uh, you did it on a metal surface. Uh, you want to take us through why you decide to do that rather than a canvas? Um, it's basically a, a practical and a material reason. Um, mm. It is practical because uh, I wanted a surface that doesn't absorb the paint when you move the paint across the surface. Mm. It, it needs to be like executed in one swift mo um, motion. Yeah. And I think materially, it's it's um, it's more slick. You know, it refers yeah. back to screens rather than paintings. I would say. Right. Yeah. So I think that's why I wanted to paint on a different surface other than than a canvas. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And it's also not the only time that you actually paint on aluminum, right? There's a couple of series later on, um, where you actually work with different sort of paints, uh, with enamel paints, for instance. Yeah. On, yeah. And, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, then we can talk about maybe from there. It's a nice way to think about, I guess, when, when I was thinking about the Gaussian, right, the distribution of so-called averages and all that, um, I, I can't help but, of course, think about, you know, the kind of waves mm -hmm. that it creates. Uh, in a way, that brings us also to the next slide, um, where, you know, the year later, you actually have 
an entire series of words, um, which some people call, I guess some people uh, sometimes call it mistakenly your foam paintings. Mm. <laughs> uh, because I guess this was a period in which you were doing a lot of monochromatic paintings and then uh, came out at the same time. Uh, and also for those of uh, those in the audience who join us a little bit earlier, uh, when you heard our elevator music, um, there's a reason why we're playing that song also. <laughs> it's kind of an elephant in the room at the moment, but uh, reason being that, um, I don't know, Jeremy, do you want to talk about it? Or Yeah, so I think um, both Kenneth and I are Joy, Joy Division fans. And um, <laughs> uh, anyone who recognizes this foam paintings would make that allusion to Joy Division's iconic album called Unknown Pleasures. Um, I mean, for those of you who are not in the know, so, um, so it was a kind of sly reference to, to pop culture as well, because um, that album particularly referenced um, uh, a diagram of an actual pulsar, which was discovered in 1968 by the scientist Jocelyn Bell. So it was designed by um, the great British designer, um, called, uh, Peter Seville. So he designed that, that iconic cover for, for Joy, Joy Division, which he in turn, he appropriated that diagram from a science encyclopedia. Um, so when I first saw the, 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 the album, um, I was very inspired by how, uh, by that diagram, because to me, it looks like a landscape, right? But yet it's a very abstract sort of um, diagram. And, um, and, and after tracing the, the, the provenance of, of the original image, I decided to I decided to, to contact uh, an, an, an actual um, astrophysicist who worked in Manchester, um, who actually specialized in the collection of uh, pulsar data. So I had this bright idea. It's like, okay, why not I make something inspired by this um, diagram, but, um, but kind of like turn it into a kind of like uh, painting meets conceptual art, you know, thingy where I translate data into a 3D relief sculpture. So, um, so this was exhibited at, this, uh, at the, the Singapore Biennale in 2013. Uh, I, I, I think I displayed four panels, the, the original white panels. Um, so they were based, uh, each panel was based on individual pulses, which are, if you, um, uh, pulses are actually uh, date stars. And why you, you call them pulses is because um, basically stars, when they die, they, 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 they radiate and they release a pulse, right? So you can't see them because of obviously very great distances, right? Um, uh, but you can hear them through, or you can sense them through through the radio wave channel. So, so what the scientists do is they collect these graphs to actually um, trace the pulses characteristics in terms of uh, size, uh, size, uh, decay, um, and, and 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 how old the star is. Um, so basically, this uh, visual translations of um, date stars, which I find very poetic. And in, in, in the spirit of also Joy Division, which I find very melancholic uh, as well. I mean, the, uh, the, the idea of what's the afterlife, you know, and something that is um, uh, beyond the world and something that is quite eternal, but it's actually um, a, a phenomenon that, 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 that talks about something that, that is actually dying. So I, I find that very interesting and romantic as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's great because what happens is that by the time these, uh, we get um, these sets of data, right, mm -hmm. um, from the, I guess, pulsating remnants of stars, yeah. um, by the time they reach us, they're, they're already long gone. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. but, yeah, so it's, it's really a kind of after image or a trace. Uh, that's all that we get. And then this right? is my, okay. probably my first real foray into really working with with hard data and translating data mm. into something specific, you know, as, mm. as, as opposed to um, the Gaussian series, which I think is kind of similar. And, and, and that's why you're, you're mm. showing it, right? Uh, which is also a, a kind of translation of signals, but I guess painting is more analog. Whereas mm. there's a kind of, uh, a sort of digital transformation where, um, where, where, where the artist's hand is also missing. You know, mm. I mean, it's not created by my hand, but it's created through a kind of collaboration with different kinds of specialists who create create the work. So, so the work yeah. is actually created by by a robotic 
machine that carves into the material, which I find very fascinating. I mean, I'm, I've always been fascinated by machines and speed. So I think, I think that um, kind of combines my, 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 my interest in working with technology as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, that's a great... Um, I pair them up mostly the Gaussian series together with TerraSensor because I think it also kind of, for me at least, um, well, there's a difference, of course, right? As you mentioned, painting is more analog and, and the way that you've dealt with the Gaussian series was a bit subjective to, to some degree, right? You're, you're looking at a, a vast set of references, photographs and colors, mm -hmm. but then also it's, it's ultimately still distilled by your own perception of these colors, right? As we all know, color is really subjective. There's no absolute color. Yeah. Color is dependent on environmental conditions. Right. Um, and then, whereas here, it's, yeah, as you mentioned, there's a kind of automatism to it, right? You're trying to, in a way, step back and just, uh, I guess the only subjectivity is the, the selection of data, right? And, yeah. and the, the material in which you have kind of chosen to work with. But, but uh, not to say that the Gaussian series had no sense of uh, automatism to them. I mean, they had, um, um, mm. because there was defined uh, strategy to actually create the, the paintings. So it was it was basically mm. following a kind of procedure or a method to create a painting. So there was a kind of automatism, but um, in place of the human um, strategy of making something now, I, I kind of replaced this with um, working with actually people, with, with scientists and working with um, data and working with machines. So, I mean, there is an automatic, there is an automat uh, an automatism, but it's, it's different in this sense. It's more mediated through, through machines, I would say, with, with the terror sensor series. Hmm. Yeah, I think there's a lag. Yeah. So, yeah, I... <laughs> Can you hear me, Kenna? I think there's a lag on your on your video end. Am I back on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I hope I'm back. Yes. Yes, there was a lag. Oh good, oh good. Uh, I know. Um, well, it's unfortunate. Anyone out there who is also a Singtel user would know the difficulties. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. Um, maybe we can go to the next slide then. You know, um, just to jump ahead uh, a few years actually to travel ahead in time. Um, yeah, four years in time to be exact. I, I wanted to also bring out this work, uh, Spectrum, uh, Mahi Mahi. Uh, for, for, I guess there's a gap, gap in four years, but I think that there's a nice connection also uh, because it's clearly, as the name suggests, quite um, pointed to your continuing interest in color, right? And and how to, try, how to play with signals also, mm. right? Um, and in particular, if I'm not wrong, correct me if I'm uh, wrong, Jeremy, but um, I seem to recall that this uh, this set of images that you can kind of see in, in, in these light box systems is actually from a, kind of like your own personal video yes. um, of a fishing trip right around Malaysia, was it? Yeah, it was in Malaysia. You're right. Yeah, could you take us through the, could you tell us a little bit also about this fishing trip and, yeah. and what you were doing with Spectrum? Um, I think the reason why it, it also took a few years to come out with this was because I was kind of like struggling with this uh, conceptually mm. and, and also find the right kind of technology to, to, to create this work and also on top of other commitments. Um, so, so what happened was um, uh, over the years of my practice, I, I was making a lot of videos actually. I, um, it's, mm. it's a little known part of my practice, but I make a lot of... Um, moving images, um, my own personal films and videos. And I usually record them when I travel. Um, so uh, I think during these years, I was traveling a lot for, for art exhibitions. And um, I had this idea to um, uh, convert the video recorded signals and turn them into light impressions. Um, so I chance upon this technology um, uh, while knowing this light engineer who worked for Philips and they had this, this obsolete light boxes that could actually convert a, a video signal into a, a, a light note or, or a light impression. So, it's, um, so what you see in, in this screen, uh, what you see in this installation or in this, um, uh, in this structure is basically um, uh, a set of light boxes that 
converts my video into light signal. So it's, it's like, it's almost akin to watching a very low res video where each pixel um, is a light source. So, so instead of watching a video, you're actually watching the flickering of light notes. Um, so in each of the blocks, I think it's, uh, it's I think it's about um, 100 plus notes in them, right? So, um, and you see an, an impression of the whole image. Uh, it's almost like looking at an impressionist painting. Like when you stand very near, you just see impressions. But when you stand back, you actually see a kind of atmospheric rendition of the videos that, that, that was converted. Yeah. converted. Yeah. So, um, and why it was, uh, I cannot mention color because I was looking at how color gets translated um, from video to light. And I was also trying to deal with non-visual ways of perception. So, I, I mean, it was my first time also dealing with uh, text and dialogue. So mm -hmm. with the installation, there were actually two voices coming from uh, two horn speakers in the gallery. And, <clears throat> and it, was a, uh, it was a male voice and a female voice. And both of these voices were reading texts about color from um, books that I, that I have collected. So which I've extracted mm -hmm. the dialogue and I turned them into a script for the actors to, 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 to read out while the impressions are occurring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, speaking about color, right? It's also the, the subject of the video itself is the pursuit of the mahi mahi fish, right? You wanna you oh, wanna yeah. take us to why why I, the mahi mahi? I, I forgot about the, the the trip. Yeah, so, um, the the main uh video was a trip that I, uh, was almost a, a twenty four hour trip that I took to Kuala Lumpur, from Singapore to Kuala Lumpur. So we drove there, and um, uh. The endeavor was about trying to catch this fish called the mahi, the mahi mahi or the dorado fish or the dolphin fish that changes color upon death. So I find that metaphor very fitting um, for the work. And mm. so what you see is actually the recorded video of me trying to catch this fish over 24 hours. Um, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, which, yeah which, which is really perfect for, you know, I think the, the whole art work that's trying to explore the whole perception of colors, right? Yes. yes um, yeah. my, my, and it's something that we'll come back to also, I think, in, in, in one or two of our slides later. Um, yeah. uh, but I also note that uh, within that same year, you also did uh, quite a similar piece that you, is actually now in the collection of Singapore Museum. If we go to the next slide, um, it should be showing, um, yeah, a white, white day, right? It's, it's, as, as I'm sure most people can tell, it's the kind of same technology that you're using, but in this case, it's not a, um, it's not even a color video that you're working with, right? Mm -hmm. And here uh, for White White Day was a black and white film, right? Yeah, so this was uh, uh, um, a, a sort of commission for Cinerama. I was like, when was this? This was in 2017. Yeah, so White White Day was kind of like, I, I think it's a work in its own right, but you can see it's, 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 it's a sequel to uh, spectrum <clears throat> um, yeah and it wasn't based on a color video but a black and white um, film that I appropriated or I borrowed mm -hmm. from um, uh, from the Catechris film uh, made in 1958 or, or 59, 59. Uh, called Koban Fitna which translates into victims of slander and um, uh, the reason for me showing that image is because I wanted to work with something more cinematic that concerns the right. cinema. So I wanted it to be in a very darkened space. And I sort of, I sort of saw this work as a deconstruction of um, um, light and sound and uh, image as well. Yeah. So uh, I took several scenes from Koban Fitna um, and mostly scenes involving um, locations in Singapore that was shot for this film, which does not exist anymore. And mm. so I wanted to link it to this idea of how memory fades with, with, with time and through. Mm. And, and, mm. so, yeah, and so a white white day was born. Um, and, um, and there was a song playing, which was a, a, a song, which is a Malay song called Burung uh, Dalam Sangkar, which means uh, bird in a cage. And that the song mm. was playing while the, the while the, the, the image was being played by the light boxes. 
So um, if you had experienced this in 2017 at Insinia Rama, it would have been quite an, um, a sort of like eerie, nostalgic kind of experience when you step into that the, the blackened box. Mm. Yeah, which is quite different from the atmospheric work of um, Mahi Mahi Spectrum. Yeah. 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 And uh, what, I, what, I, what I remember the first time seeing this work and what was kind of uh, intriguing, but also annoying to me that time was that <laughs> as I was trying to approach it, right? You know, you're trying to uh, get up close and, and get a sense of the, the, the light boxes and how it works, mm. right? And, and also because I guess um, compared to Spectrum, now you see this complete trial set of yeah. uh, light boxes and then you are presented with presumably the full frame of the, the cinema, cinematic image. Yeah. And so you're trying to, and at the same time, trying to figure out what the, you know, what the work was trying to show, right? Yes. Um, but that's this dissolution of the, this blurring and dissolving of this image. Yeah. Um, and that forces me to just take in the work as atmosphere rather than yeah. some kind of representation of, um, yeah. you know, the past or, or, you know, cinema history, for instance, right? Hmm. And of course, then what struck me, of course, is the title itself, The White White Day, and then because this is in varying uh, temperatures of white. From far when you see it, I remember seeing it, it, it looked like vaguely like everything is white, you know. Mm. But, but when you get up close, then you start to see the varying temperatures of white. And, and, and to me, then it also, again, even though it, you know, uh, it doesn't really talk about it, there's, there's always a sort of interest with uh, perception of color, mm -hmm. uh, but largely perceptions themselves, right? Because if you spend time and actually look at it, you can actually discern the, the footage, the clips. Yeah, you roughly can. what's happening right yeah yeah which is always nice um and then uh we move to the next work uh, on the next slide uh which you presented at uh ms yes right uh the year later yeah. uh i think this is the first few works i remember um encountering where i realized that oh yeah jeremy is also a musician right so he's he's actually also interested in sound um, but this was really one of the first few times I experienced, you know, you working with sound prominently. I mean, there was always sound like in Spectrum and even in White White Day. But this for me was the first time actually um, I remember um, that, you know, you work dominantly with uh, sound. Um, if I'm not wrong, I think this, the, there's a whole archive of sounds um, from songs that you've collected, right, uh, along the coastal communities in the region. Yes. Yeah. Right. Should I talk a bit more? About this yeah yeah so yeah so you're right to say that it was um first time that i felt predominantly in sound um uh the voice to be exact i was working with the human voice um i think it's because um i thought working with images was a bit too um predictable or maybe too violent to what i wanted to mm. to represent which are basically um communities in um, our region. So I was trying to, to uncover songs sung by communities that are not very visible. Um, and so I traveled to see um, the, mm. the Orang Salita, which is, which is at the um, south of Johor. Where, I mean, they used to live around Singapore as well. But, but, but after, the, after Singapore's rapid modernization, they sort of like, um, they had to move north to the yeah, and so I collected some songs from them. Um, so um, I just brought my my tape recorder and drove to to Joe to meet them. Um, and so we we had to, to, to we had to go through several meetings to actually get something done. And the the other mm. communities I was interested in was the um, was the Rohingya community in in, um, in KL, uh, which is uh, there was a community school. Uh, called the, the Rohingya Community School, and I, I worked with the children there to, to collect some mm. songs from them. And the other two was uh, uh, was a uh, uh, I went to Indonesia to to collect some Japanese songs, and and the other one was the Kristong community, which is closer to to my heritage, because my grandmother was yeah. an Eurasian, uh, was in Portuguese Eurasian. So I went to Malacca to collect songs from the Eurasian or the Kristong community. Uh, which was sang, which was sang in a Creole called uh, Kristan, which is a kind of Portuguese. Yeah. So I collected these songs and I made a, a, a tapestry of one composition. So, uh, so it seemed like um, as the viewer as, as the viewer enters the space, um, 
one encounters um, uh, these communities through the voice as a proxy. So they are listening to um, the speakers, which are actual speakers, right? And mm. they are actually playing um, the, the, the recorded songs of these communities. And, um, it's, and I weave them into one, uh, like a nine minute composition. So, it, so you didn't see anything. I mean, you, there were no figures, there was no representation. It was just basically hearing a kind of like ad hoc choir singing. Um, so, yeah. so at one point, you it, it seemed like all like like all these people were actually singing together, but it was actually kind of like man, manipulated on, on on my part to put these voices together in one recording to sound like as if they were singing together. So it was um, very challenging uh, um, working with composition. So I think that's where my I guess my background as a musician comes in working with. Um, uh, sound recording um, and composition. Mm. And, uh, in the other room, uh, which I call um, the, the, the reading room, it was basically um, an, an, an archive of uh, materials that I gathered, basically reading materials that helped me in my research. And so it it um, featured a bit of my writing and a bit of stuff that I was reading, uh, like, like, like essays and books. And mm. also, um, the unused lyrics that that was uh, mm. from from the communities and I sort of like put them on the table and presented them as a kind of object display. So so, mm. so the point is to have um, two rooms. One was the listening room and one was the reading room. And one was like a kind of darkened space. The other was a brightly lit space where you can actually uh, mm. use the, 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 the reading materials. Mm. And you were mentioning that you actually displayed uh, in the reading room a a uh, set of your own writings on notes and reflections, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So I, I wanted to <clears throat> because I, I thought it was it was important to to see I uh, to see how I come in as an artist producing the works and tune to it. Mm. Because I think um, to me it's 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 a problem of trying to represent these people which I'm not trying to. So um, I'm just coming in as a kind of proxy as an artist mm. producing something. Um, so I think it was very important to highlight my own subjectivity and my own reflections. And I think this also got me to, to think about works that actually unfold in time. You know, things that yeah. are quite complete and things that are always in progress and things that are always in formation, you know, I guess. And, 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 and I think writing yeah. for me, writing is an exercise that helps me form these ideas or help me to formulate my thoughts uh, over time yeah to, to to give some form to what i'm thinking about yeah, mm. yeah. i don't know if that sounds too abstract mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah it's essentially no 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 I, I think that yeah precisely in my own personal observation i feel like uh, in the last uh two to three years you kind of use writing as a means also for your uh to give yourself the time and space right um, rather than just creating, let's say, an object for an uh, exhibition space. Yeah. Um, you want to use writing as a means to give yourself the time to unfold some thoughts. Yeah, I was trying to figure out mm. different kinds of... And you've, even, you've not stopped writing either. Sorry? Sorry? I, I was just mentioning that you... No, I was just mentioning that you've not stopped writing also, right? Yeah, I, I, I enjoy writing. I, I, I enjoy playing music because I think these are... Uh, uh, forms that deal with emotions and thoughts rather than something concrete, right? Like like a like an object in, 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 a, in yeah. an exhibition. So it's just yeah. me trying to find different avenues. Like if you don't produce an an, an artwork for a gallery, what do you do as an artist? You know. So so these are things that I I was doing anyway. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which is also then you know it leads me to uh, the next slide. Um, when I was thinking also you know this recent project you, you just launched. Uh, earlier this year, right, um, Ulan Unjung, um, which is an online curatorial project of yours. Um, and and in it, you know, you have your own section. Yes. Right. And I really enjoyed um, the section of yours where there was a whole video. Um, I guess it's a return of the Mahi Mahi as a figure. Yeah. Uh, but where you also write um, this whole long essay, I guess, or a postscript, as you put it, yeah. um, about 
this whole experience of thinking about hunting the mahi mahi or experience um, through thinking about color, but also, um, I guess, just ruminating on all these things about perception themselves and 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 film, yeah. Um, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like like I said, you know, like I mean, sometimes you know, like we may call it projects, but you know, to me, they're they're artworks and. Mm. and and, and artworks are never finished. You know, sometimes you have burning questions still or you have like some unanswered things that you want to go back to. So I thought it was very important to create this platform, not just for myself, but, but other artists that want to return to certain images that they have um, mm. or they are interested in coming back to. And, and so, and, 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 and also to not just to explore it not, not to just explore it through the moving image, but to, to also explore it through writing. Because mm. I think it's, uh, writing is uh, contemporaneous with making the, 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 the image. And it goes together, mm. it goes hand in hand. It's, I think it's, it's quite important to see how an artist thinks about the world or thinks about making. I think these are things that we don't realize when we go to, 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 to exhibitions when we see a very cut and dry write up about, about a work and, and how, mm. how she think about the work. But, but often thinking is a, it's a much more complicated and you know meandering process, you know. Like, yeah. So I think it's very important to 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 see how this is done in writing and, and thinking about artwork and and so mm. I I created this platform to also support other artists whose works I'm interested in and to also support them. Um, so it's basically a platform where we show artists' films and videos and like, yeah moving images with their writings. So I thought um, it's something that's not quite done before and I wanted to try something yeah. different. Yeah. Yeah, no, I really, I really like um, Lano Jung itself. Uh, and I encourage, you know, maybe it's a blatant uh, product placement here, but I encourage everyone to, you know, when you have time to check out uh, the website, which you can see from the screenshot. Um, there's a very beautiful um, written essay by Jeremy. Uh, as, as, also, as you can tell from the title, it's also quite poetic. Uh, where he's reflecting on um yeah the death of the mahi mahi himself right quite melancholic uh. yeah but just a note we just ended the, the the program actually last week um or this monday uh, mm. but, but but the writing is still exists in the website uh but i might i might uh show them all together again we we are thinking about um doing that uh, i'm just discussing mm -hmm. this now but uh, the program is closed but the writing is still is still available online Sure. I mean, I'm sure if anyone's interested, they'll reach out, you know, they'll ask. Yep, yep, uh, uh, and to watch that entire 83 minutes of that film, that uh, Mahi Mahi itself. It's quite quite amazing, actually. There's a scene that I really, really like um, with the with the fishing guide himself wearing that whole Mahi Mahi, uh, uh, what do you call that, that face shield or something. And he's saying that, you know, yeah, yeah. he's wearing the skin of the Mahi Mahi. Yes. Uh, to protect, to give himself strength, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's really some beautiful moments there. Um, Thank you. All right. Uh, I hope that also gives us, you know, uh, many of uh, the audience who have joined us a, a rough sense of Jeremy's practice because um, I think all these things are quite important uh, in terms of the way that Jeremy works, um, as well as some of his research interests and and his, um, I guess, uh, inclinations as an artist. Um, because um, the work that you're going to see on the next slide. Um, what you roughly see here is the installation view um, that I mentioned, which is currently on show at uh, Woodlands Regional Library. Um, the work's title is called Slender. Um, there's a whole, as you can tell from the structure, um, it's a whole series of modular steel structures um, in this kind of grid-like fashion uh, in black and green. Uh, there's some UV prints on, on there. Um, these are mostly um, film stills from a selection of films that Jeremy has been watching and re-watching. Um, and thinking and writing about, uh, as well as some TV monitors that shows um, very select film clips that um, Jeremy has sort of cut, edited um, from the archive of categories films, um, cut, edited, and programmed so that they kind of loop, but also shuffle themselves across the entire structure. Um, and on, uh, on the next slide, you will see uh, just some close-ups um, where you can see, obviously, um, on the left here right now is a uh, footage from Koban Pitna. 
this is a quite a particularly uh, iconic moment of the film because that's like the accusation of the crime, right? Uh, of committing adultery. Uh, we can talk more about that film also if anyone's interested. But um, also on the right, you can see uh, on the tables uh, as displayed uh, a couple of um, books as well as uh, manuscripts and ongoing manuscript uh, that Jeremy is writing. Um, it's still in progress and it will probably accumulate as it as the project moves from as a mini mobile museum project uh, moves to Jurong and Tampines. So it's an ongoing manuscript. And uh, as I understand it, it's a fictional autobiography um, of a figure or protagonist by the name of Remy Shah, <laughs> which I think is no, uh, you know, it's not a surprise to most people that it's a abbreviation, I suppose, of Jeremy's name. Uh, Jeremy Sharma to Ravi Shah. Um, you want to talk us through a little bit of um, what you were sort of trying to do with this uh, manuscript? Oh, with the manuscript, yeah. Uh, hmm. Okay. Um, I think it's uh, it feels like a, a, a continuation um, in my interest hmm. in writing uh, from my, my last few projects and um, I think it's it's a uh, well slender. It's a it's a it's a it's an installation that has text in them. Like I see text as a as an object as well. And um, I've always been interested in how text and language is is displayed. Uh, but I also wanted to delve a little bit into writing. And um, I had the impetus to write this manuscript after watching the films. And mm. I watched about six films from from Gatikris, and they all range from slapstick and comedy fair to horror to film noir and and um i wanted to produce something about writing about watching films and writing and, and mm. how that and how i locate myself in film history and also in the contemporary or in the present truth mm. so i wanted to merge a bit of that so and hence i call it a kind of like Auto fiction. Right? That's a little bit of things that that happen in my life, but also it kind of like my character gets mixed up with the characters in these films, which I find very interesting. And um, and 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 I think fiction gives you an an avenue to talk about a lot of things that you don't would normally would not normally talk if it's the truth, right? So I think it also alludes to the idea of slander and what you're supposed to say and what you're not supposed to say. Um, uh yeah so it's a work in progress um uh, the writing accumulates as the exhibition continues over three venues right um and i'm hoping to kind of maybe turn it into a publication in the future but right now i'm, I'm just having fun writing I'm trying to bang out words every day and it, um and it's all about uh it's it's really about kind of meditation and reflect reflection on watching films and also mm. the phenomenological experience uh, and back to what um, Kenneth has mentioned about perception how we perceive mm. uh, images in, 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 in films and, and through, mm. through the lens of history um, so you also look mm. at history through, through the lens of film right mm. uh, but it's, 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 it's a film that is not uh, or it's a history that's not uh, not your official history that you discover in textbooks. So mm. um, as you're looking at the, as, at the films, you're doing research, you're looking at how it's made, um, what audience was it catered to in, back in the day, you know, and the kind of like social demographic of Singapore then. So I think I, I learned quite a lot. I learned quite a lot while, uh, so, so, so the point is to make research fun, you know, it's not to make research boring. I mean, research shouldn't be boring. So research should be fun and while you're, Having fun, you're you 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 actually learning. So you are you are uncovering things about history, about um, actors and and actresses, about politics, and uh, yeah, yeah. and about your own life. So I think watching the films, uh, certain scenes brought me certain memories, which I don't know to be uh, are they legitimate memories or not? Because you know memories can be distortions as well. Think, yeah. You know what I mean? But you do remember certain things like when you look at certain scenes like, you know, this reminds me of things that I used to do with my father. Or or I recall certain scenes that remind me of certain things in your childhood. You know what I mean? Mm. So I think um, these things are like triggers to to um, churn out words. You know, yeah, so yeah. Hence the manuscript. 
So they'll be um, presented together with books, which I thought mm. are useful and, and instrumental to my research. I mean, um, uh, books which are from my, from my library and uh, which I borrowed. Um, they are, uh, and these books are books that I might have read or I might not have read, read it, um, but they become more like, like, like objects of art. Yeah. When they get translate, when they get translated in this uh, photocopied objects, and to be presented with the writing and um, with the videos and the stories, mm. yeah. So together they form a kind of total artwork. You know, I, so it's an yeah. it's a mixed media installation of uh, writing, yeah. text, uh, still and moving images. Yeah. yeah, I think what yeah what I really appreciate the project and maybe is you know, in a way betrayed by by a steel photo is that the work is actually quite dynamic because you do have um, the videos not just looping, right? But then they also kind of shuffle around yeah. um, throughout the, the structure itself. So you have the structure that looks quite, you know, sturdy, rigid, orderly in this like very, um, I guess, strong grid presence, right? Um, but then at the same time, you have the flux of um, the videos that keep shifting yeah, exactly. And then if anyone actually spends time reading through the manuscript, you find that it's a, it's a auto fiction that really kind of weaves in and out of memories, yeah. uh, images, everything. Yeah, yeah. Actually, kind of your right to to mention how the the grids are very rigid and modular and modern and quite imposing because they're still stru steel structures. Mm. But the ones that are in flux are the moving images and the writing, which is quite yeah. I'll say unruly you know what i mean so it, it's a nice uh, foil or it's a complement to the rigid structures and the, in the modern uh, geometry of, of this steel structures yeah yeah, yeah. so I, I really encourage anyone who hasn't been to see it to to spend time uh, with the structure to to have a greater sense of um the sort of tension i suppose between the rigidity of the structure but the also light um, breeziness in which um, the films kind of loop and um, shuffle themselves, but then also the, as Jeremy mentioned, right, the unruly <laughs> fictions uh, that he has sort of written out. Um, I've been sort of uh, pressed to 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 take questions at this moment because I, uh, yeah, we we've, we've kind of like talked for too long. <laughs> um, but yeah, maybe we can just kind of run through the the some of the video clips as we take questions as I read out the questions so that the uh, the some of these clips that Jeremy has edited can just function as a kind of atmosphere. Yeah. Um, There's a lot of just, interior design, okay. But I'll, 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 I'll leave it to you, uh, Kenneth, to just yeah, start. Ah, okay. So we have an interesting question. And actually, I almost wanted to ask you that. Um, <laughs> uh, we'll come to it. So uh, this is an anonymous person. <laughs> well, uh, someone's asking, are you influenced by interior design, like Fidelity and previous work um, that you showed? I think. Uh, I guess this person might be quite struck by a strong design element in, yeah. in most of your work. Yeah, it's, I think it's a good question. Um, yeah, interior design. I never thought about it. Well, maybe I did. Um, but I probably I wouldn't think of it as interior design, but there is elements of interior design. Um, I guess interior design is important in creating spaces. Um, mm. I mentioned in my last uh, few exhibitions, um, uh, I'm not so much interested in interior design as I'm interested in the, in ideas of interiority. So like mm. bringing viewers inside into spaces or defining spaces that become something else for you, for the viewer. Mm. So like a listening room, like a reading room, uh, like a panel display. So for Slender, I was looking at display systems. Um, uh, I was looking at very different artists who have worked with so like furniture and interior and exhibition structures to create works. So, uh, so design is a strong element, and um, and it, it's uh, it's a medium by itself. And I think it's recently it's been quite integral to my practice. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, th this question also. I mean, it's kind of uh, related to a question that I have. Is that I always suspected that you have a graphic design inclination uh, well, i may well, be wrong well when i went to art school i wanted to to become a graphic designer but i ended up being an artist yeah 
but you would say like painting is the opposite of interior design because painting is very analog, it's very um, mm. uh, physical and very emotional. You know, you're dealing with pain. You're, 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 you're dealing with this sense of formlessness, um, the behavior of painting on the canvas, right? And but, but what you see in my work now is very sort of like structure and design. But it is still mm. very painterly because I have people. I actually have painters telling me that my, my work is very painterly. So I think I, it, it takes a painter to probably realize things that I, I've taken from paintings to put mm. in interior design. So it's, well, I'm not sure, but maybe in terms of how I look at images, how I look at mm. um, design dynamics and principles and yeah, and um, perception, I guess, yeah. yeah. Mm. I mean, I partly, partly mentioned this also because uh, you know, for Slender, the, the books, right? That you actually design covers for them using this uh, silk screen type font uh, that yeah. you created. Yeah, it was looking at uh, fonts that looks sensational or, or pop, pop fiction like. So, we were looking at, so, my, so my intern and I were looking at, at, at a lot of like um, pop fiction fonts mm -hmm. to create that look, you know, of, uh, of the 50s or and the 50s. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a very strong graphic element to so it. There, yeah, so uh, there was a lot of like graphic design elements that I employed for this exhibition. Yeah. Okay, I should I should take the other question. Uh, let me see. Um, so, <laughs> okay, I, I have Isako's question then, but maybe we can answer. I'll, I'll, I'll answer. I'll, I'll, well, I don't know if you want to answer this. Um, there's one question that asks, um, how do you come up with the list of films? Um, and what are some of their commonalities? Yeah, uh, this was actually in discussion with uh, Kenneth. We went through the list of films provided by the Asian Film Archives together, and we what what were we discussing, uh, Kenneth? Like, what was that? <laughs> I think it was always the idea <laughs> that uh, you should choose from a specific period that is significant to us. And in this case, we looked at um, the period between um, fifty eight and sixty three because um, uh, fifty three. 58 is mostly known in our film history as the as the year in which our local film studios, so in the case of uh, Malay film productions run by Shaw, as well as Kete Curry's obviously run by Kare, uh, Kete, they produced the most number of films domestically uh, in that year itself, 20 films to be exact. Uh, so this, this was always considered the golden year of this so-called golden age of, I guess, local cinema. Uh, and then 63 was really, I think, uh, uh, what some scholars decide as the, the rough time in which um, cinema started declining in Singapore because there was the introduction of televisions, um, but then also because of the formation of Malaysia with KL being the, the new capital, um, some of your human resource people actually, uh, some of the talents I suppose actually moved to KL instead. And so 63 is always kind of um, marked as that, that gradual decline. So we wanted to look at a selection of films from that period um, together um, and what are some of the commonalities? Uh? They're quite sensational, right? I mean, most of them are quite uh, yeah, sensationalized. Yeah. yeah. Right. Scenes of gangsters, thieves. Yeah. Uh, I was I was attracted to scenes of the outsider, like like the orang mm. the gangsters, the the comedian actor. So things uh, people are the the kampung men in the in the city. So, you know, things that are misfits that don't quite fit in their environments. I was very interested in that, mm. in, that in those themes and things. <laughs> yeah, should we end with the last question? I think there's a question from Ezekiel. Um, so Ezekiel's asking, do you have some sort of mission statement <laughs> that you hold as an artist that keeps you going with your practice? Uh, not consciously, mission statement. <laughs> <laughs> what a mission statement. <laughs> That sounds like a I don't know if you put it up on your wall somewhere. <laughs> Hi, Kelvin. <laughs> How are you? Um, uh, but I remember two, two things that are quite useful for art for me. I mean, um, one is by a tech entrepreneur. I mean, surprise, it's not an artist. And he said something like, um, always make something to avoid competition. <laughs> I think that's what I've been doing. I mean, I mean, that's one way of saying like, don't make trendy art, you know? It's like, do things that, that are, are unusual and things that you might not be comfortable with. Um, and the mm -hmm. other one is by Wim Wenders and he said something like, um, uh, only make the art that, that, 
make the art that only you can make. You know, whatever that means. I think that that that's quite. It's, it's a very simple uh, advice, and it's really like there there are some things that only you with your sensibilities can make, whether it's made by your hand or not. I mean, it's it's a kind of like. Um, your ethos or your personality or your or your worldview, you know, and your attitude mm. kind of embodied in the work, you know, and and I sort of believe in that. Like whatever I do, um, will have traces of me inside, whether you see you see me in it or not, you know. So I think that's important. That what that to me feels authentic, you know. Mm. And it, and it doesn't matter whether I make it in my hand or I use technology or machines to create the work or whether it's interior design. Um, uh, I don't discriminate uh, between my artworks. Uh, I've, I've made works with, I've made works which are drawn by my hand, painting, and I've, and I've collaborated with with, uh, with groups of collaborators. And and to me, I don't discriminate them between like this artwork is better than this artwork. I mean, to me, it's all mm. all art. It's all creative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a uh, tech entrepreneur and a filmmaker. <laughs> <laughs> Don't quote me on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think. Um, do we have any more questions? Oh, right. Kelvin is just thanking you, I guess. Uh, Thanks. Like yeah. That. So um, with that, maybe we can draw to a close. I want to thank everyone for joining us, and I'll pass the time over to Gabby. Thank you so much to Jeremy and Kenneth for their very insightful conversation and, you know, really taking us through glimpses of your art, your practice as an artist. And I think I really enjoyed seeing and hearing more about the stories behind the many, many mediums that you work with and that you explore. It's great that, you know, you really take time to discover and to try new mediums. Um, we would also like to thank the National Library Board for partnering with us on the Sam Mini Mobile Museum. And also thank you to everybody for spending your Thursday night with us um, on a date with Sam Jeremy Sharma. We hope that you have had a wonderful time.